it's essentially what's referred to as, as a tentacle, right? It's just an appendage without bones. But you can see here they're capable of very fine motor skills, right? They're measuring how it eats it, it picks up stuff off the scale, and the amount of pressure it puts on the scale is no more than you or I might if we were picking up that stuff. So even though it's a huge elephant, it has a lot of control. Okay, so this design principle of kind of soft robotics that biology sort of uses is actually incredibly powerful and has a lot of freedom and it has some other real advantages. So people actually, soft robots already exist, right? This is a thing that people have already made. So this is called the Glacis open source soft robot. You can download a, a, a file to 3D print this at home if you want. This is made out of a piece of rubber. It's essentially like a, a balloon that is always going to bend in the same way when you inflate it, right? You can see there's two kind of pipes coming out the back where they supply air pressure to make it walk. So how does this work? So as I said, it's made out of like a piece of rubber, so it's a dark blue, it's the edges of the rubber, and you see it's kind of hollow in the inside, with the hollow running all the way through, okay? And this thing is, it's elastic, right? It's going to be bendy, but it's, more importantly, it's made out of one material. This is all rubber. There's no hinges, there's no bits of plastic or anything like that. Okay, so if I get a pump and I pump air in there, all these kind of round compartments are going to inflate slightly, and because this, this backbone wants to maintain its length, the whole thing is going to bend, right? If I increase the pressure a little bit, right, it's going to bend more. Okay, and this is the principle on which many soft robots work. I mean, I mean, this is uh, the one I showed you, I didn't know the NASA are using soft robots, they come into medical devices, Right, so this is not a, a new thing, but I mean, it's a relatively new thing, but it's not something that I've Okay, so very importantly, sorry, I just want to say one more thing about this slide. Right, so as, as I said, this is very simple to make, right? It's made out of one material, you can 3D, 3D print it. So you essentially take a file, you put it into your 3D printer, and then, I don't know, an hour later, you have a robot, right? And all the responses to that material are somehow programmed into its structure, right? So if you design this, you know, okay, this is always going to bend up when I when I inflate it. Okay. So now let's let's come back to biology, right? So what are your standard biological actuators? Right. When I got my digger, it was uh, it was a uh, kind of a hydraulic pump. Um, so in biology, of course, you look at us, right? It's muscles, right? You have a hip skeleton, and the muscles connect against your skeleton, and they shrink. And the, well, they don't expand, they shrink, right? And then you have to have an actuator on the other side that contracts, right, to move your arm or your leg or whatever it is, right? And these muscles are made out of muscle fibers that are called sarcomates, right? And they have roughly this structure. It's very, very simplified, okay? But there are kind of three, well, two components, should I say, here. There's the myosin filament in the middle, and there's these active filaments around the edge, and they're arranged in this way. You can think of it as these are like little kind of trains, and these are like train tracks, and the red bits, the red heads of the mice, and I want to, to process along the acting filament. Right? So that, that's going to require some fuel, just like anything, okay? And that fuel is going to be a standard biological fuel, ATP, right? This stuff gets burnt up, and as the red heads try and move up the kind of blue tracks, the blue tracks actually move inward because of conservation of momentum. Okay? So you have your actuators that are just going to contract the heads. So let's say we just make a material out of this, right? So we just make a whole network that have only biological actuators, right? We just stick a load of them together and, uh, and see what it does, right? Sounds like a cool experiment. Well, fortunately, somebody has already done it, right? This is uh, the lab of Anne Bernheim, and this is a uh, microscopy picture. So they take all the ingredients to make this material, mix it together, along with a lot of more complicated uh, experimental techniques, which I don't really know, Right, and then they stick it, they kind of pipette it onto a microscope slide and have a look and see what it does. You see here it forms this network, so this, these, uh, these lines you can see are dense regions of lots and lots of these little biological actuators. Okay? And you see that as it forms, as I said before, your muscles contract. So once this forms a network, it contracts because there is also ATP present. Right? So you see this thing kind of shrinks once it forms a network. Okay, so we're starting to build up this idea of a biological soft robot. So, and so let's see something interesting. If you make like a, you start off with a, a droplet of this stuff between two microscope slides, right? So it's going to be roughly disc shaped. Then you let it contract, and after a while you start to see this. It's actually bubbled. So this, this region is uh, obviously in the plane of the microscope, whereas these regions are out of plane. 
But here you can see the projections in, in the kind of x, x z and y z directions. You can see it's actually buckled in 3D. But it's actually even clearer if I show you this in this video. So you see here that what, you, what was a flat sheet initially, as it's contracted, it stayed roughly flat in the middle, but it now has these waves running around the edge. Okay, so it's buckled into what we would call a saddle shape, flat in the middle with waves around the edge. Okay, so why does it do this? As I said before, this just starts off as a droplet pipetted onto a slide. So it starts off as roughly that shape, right? Kind of like a thin disc. And as everything contracts, you might naively think, okay, it's going to get smaller, I'm going to end up with a, a smaller droplet, right? A smaller disc shaped droplet. This obviously doesn't happen because it, it shrinks and then it buckles, and you end up with something that looks like this. So why might that be? Well, the answer here is actually quite simple. When you think about it, it doesn't contract homogeneously or isotropically. So this means that two regions of the gel might not contract to the same degree or at the same speed, and they might not even contract in the same direction. Okay, so I'm going to show you that there now in a second. So here we go. And this is our kind of like very simple view of this kind of unit cell of biological actuator. Right, this is some actin and myosin coupled together. Right? And as I said before, these things are going to shrink, generally speaking, and this is what we built our network out of, out of the bundles of this stuff. So this, obviously, when it shrinks, it essentially creates a force diagram in this shape. Okay? So these arrows, as you can see, it pushes in or pulls in towards the middle. So these arrows, one point one way, one point the other way. So if I rotate them by 180 degrees, they look identical. Essentially, what this is saying is, once I look at this force, I actually can't tell which way around this little actuator is. I don't know whether this is the top or this is the top, because they're identical, it's just pulling inwards. Okay? This is what we refer to in physics as having pneumatic symmetry. Right? This pole has pneumatic symmetry, because it's got a red, of, well, it actually doesn't. So it has a bit of yellow tape. So I can tell that this is the yellow end, and this is the end without yellow tape. If it didn't have this yellow tape, so it just had a black end on the end and a black end on the end, and I spun it round, you wouldn't know whether it, and I spun it again and again, unless you're counting the spins, you don't actually know which end is which, right? Because it's identical. But this one's actually polar because it has a yellow tape. But we're talking about things that are pneumatic. Okay? So I have, if I have some region, some sort of like region of this gel that happens to have kind of coalesced as it, as it, uh, as it kind of forms into something like this, then this region is going to contract more in that direction than in any other direction. Okay? And this region is going to contract more in that direction than in the other direction. So you can see now that if these arrows aren't necessarily lined up, I wouldn't necessarily expect this to just contract uniformly. Okay, so we're going to have to do some kind of model building now, some theory. So the experiment has rotational symmetry. So if I look at it from the top, it's a circle. And essentially, just like I couldn't tell one end from the other of, of one of those actuators, I can't tell one angle from the other. This, this circle is essentially the same whether I rotate it or not. Right? The contraction is going to have pneumatic symmetry. Right? So these things are these lines, and I can tell they have an orientation. Right? It's not oriented 90 degrees to that, but I can't tell whether it's that way or 180 degrees relative to that way. Right? So these two things actually clash, these two concepts they have the incorrect symmetry to fit together. Having, having actuators with this symmetry and a system with this symmetry means there must be topological defects. Okay, so I'm sure most of you know what topological defects are, but I'm gonna go through it quickly. There are essentially regions of a vector field in this case, where because of your boundary conditions, you have to have a point where you can't tell what the orientation of your vector field is. Okay, so you can tell what it is anywhere, but there's gonna be one point, one special point where it doesn't fit. So there's one uh, theorem on this called the poincare hopf theorem. This essentially will tell you how many different types of defects you have to have in any vector field. The way it's often uh, kind of explained is with pair. Right? So if you go to Wikipedia, this is, if you go to the poincare hopf theorem, this is the picture they have. Right? And this baby, I mean, you can't see, but their hair essentially points out like a fringe at every point at the edge of their hair, which means in the middle it has to have a plus one defect, which in this case is a spiral. So, as some of you may know, actually, I'm a recent father, so I can't do this slide without having my own example. I was very pleased to see when I looked at my daughter's head, she has a slightly more complex pattern. So this is uh, my brand new experimental collaborator, Charlie. Okay, and you see here, there is 
a plus one here, this is a spiral going this way, there's a plus one here, a spiral going the opposite way, and a minus one here, okay? So if I add up these, I get one. If I add up this, obviously, I get one. Because my daughter's hair still essentially points out from the center of her head at her fringe all the way around the head, okay? So even though she has this slightly different arrangement of the vector field on her head, naturally, her hair still looks fairly normal. And as I, I should so I can cite my collaborators and the fact that it's quite hard to take a picture of a baby's, the back of a baby's head when you've got a, a phone with the right phone case and they're like, ooh, what's that? So uh, this is my first attempt. <laughs> this is my collaborator, Charlie, who's uh, seven months old, nearly. Okay. So, so how does that apply to our system? So as I said, it's got rotational symmetry. So we're starting off with a circle, right? And I say, okay, it's defined by the boundary. Okay, so I say, what happens if at the boundary, my actuators are all located kind of parallel to the boundary, tangential alignment, right? As I kind of try to follow this pattern inward, it's going to look like this, right? I'm going to get concentric circles in the middle. I don't really know whether this is meant to be vertical or horizontal or stuff. So here I have a topological defect, charge plus one at the center. And maybe you don't believe in this Poincaré hop theorem, and you're like, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. What about if I do something like this, right? I all, all arrange them perpendicular to the boundary, right? And if I do exactly the same thing and kind of follow the pattern inward, again, I don't know which way it's going to be oriented in the middle, right? Because it's equidistant from every part of the boundary. So again, a topological defect plus one. And just in case you really want to be sure, every angle in between, right? You're going to say, okay, I'm just going to pick some random angle here. I do exactly the same thing. I'm going to be a spiral. These all have the same topological charge plus one, right? And I can essentially, you know, these have names, a vortex, a spiral, and an aster, right? Relatively obvious names. Okay, but I can characterize them by this angle phi, which is the angle between the actuator and the boundary. So here it's zero because they're parallel, here it's pi by two because they're perpendicular, and here it's essentially anything in between. And this spiral, if I wanted to reverse the direction of this spiral, so it's kind of going the other way, that would essentially just mean that this becomes minus. Okay, and that's, and that's the only values it can take. Okay, so now we're going to get on to, this is one of the slides that, that uh, you don't have to pay too much attention to to get through it, but maybe you want it for a bit of, uh, to know how we actually do this in, in our group. Um, so we start off with our gel, and we're going to say, okay, we're just going to, we're going to zoom in on some small region of the gel, and we're going to simulate it, right? We want to approximate this material which is made up of these actuators, these kind of bits of, kind of biological muscle. Right, so the first thing I do is I'm going to divide it up, right, into regions. So these regions don't necessarily represent anything. I'm just going to say, well, it's easier to simulate something if I kind of define a region rather than just trying to simulate the entire thing at once, right? So I just divide it up. Let's say each one of these little square, or sorry, Voronoi areas, should I say, represents just some little region of my material, okay? And then I'm going to do, perform a triangulation, right, to so the blue lines, and I'll connect the center of each of these regions. Right, and I'm going to say, okay, now I have a network that it represents my material. Okay, so these blue lines are all perpendicular to the red lines. So essentially, if these two cells share an edge, right, they're going to have a blue line going through it that's going to be perpendicular. And I'm going to use this blue line to approximate the stress going through that edge. Okay, and the way I do that, I say, okay, well, this is an elastic material, just like a soft robot. So I'm just going to say, okay, all of these blue lines are now just springs. Right? So I have a system here, but if I try and deform it and stretch it, it'll return to its original shape because this network can't change. Essentially, it can't disconnect two points that are connected, and all these blue lines want to remain the same length. So the whole material will react elastically. Right? And now I say, okay, well, what do my actuators do? So this uh, actin, uh, well, the myosin, should I say, the, the active part, as we saw, this contracts things. And this contracts them on some direction. There's some average direction that the, the kind of little actuators have, and they're going to contract more in that direction than any other direction. So let's, for example, imagine that I have a vortex here. So my, uh, the, so my on average, my, my actuators are going to be arranged like this. Okay. In this little box here, I can say, well, there's probably a vector field that represents that vortex, right? So in this little box, I'm essentially on the edge of this vortex, I'm going to get these green lines. And these represent the average orientation of a myosin, uh, actin, actin myosin filament in this very small region. Okay? And now, 
you're going to have some real equations. It's this one on the slide you can really just ignore, but it's, it's not too complicated. Right, so as I said before, a gel is a circle. So we're going to use polar coordinates. So usually when you give coordinates, you say x, y, right? Here we're going to say r as in distance from the center and theta as in distance around. Okay? We have some filament orientation, some average filament orientation, which I'm going to call p. So this essentially gives me the average orientation of one of the single biological actuators. Okay? And I can define this just by some angle, right? This is the same angle that I had before, right? So phi equals zero is going to be an aster, and phi equals, oh, it's actually it's out of phase by, ah, okay. well, that's a typo, but this is actually how it is for the rest of the talk. So phi equals zero is going to give me an aster, phi equals pi by two is going to give me a vortex. Right, so I can write down the equation for this vector like this, right, very simple. I'm going to have to combine this with some order parameters. So as I said before, you remember that picture of Poincaré hot there, I said, in the very center, the orientation is not defined. Right? You don't know which way to orientate your little uh, kind of arrow when it's at the very center because it's equidistant from the boundary everywhere. Okay? So that means I have to introduce some kind of order parameter that says, how well do I know this orientation? Right? Which is going to be zero at the edge, sorry, zero in the middle, and then it's going to be, say, one at the edge where I'm like, oh, I'm certain that the, the, uh, the, the kind of filaments are aligned well here. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to quote this down. This is going to be R squared because this is zero when R is zero, and it's one when R is one, okay? Okay, and now I have the rest length of these springs. So if you remember, I had these, this network with these springs, and I have to decide what happens. So these mycin, right, they shrink things. And I'm gonna say, well, that changes the rest length of the spring. So imagine I just have a normal spring, and when I stretch it or, or compress it, it wants to return to its original length. I'm saying, well, what the mycin does is it changes the original length that it wants to return to. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, your number is increasing from zero to one, but linearly or six to five, do you know? Is it, is this mind is kind of like acting just like quite isotropic? Um, Sorry, do you, you want to frame it from zero to one? You said that was your question. Okay. Yeah, I know. It's just a profile you go from from zero to. I, it's just a square, right? So it'd be like a, it'd be like this is the middle of a paraboloid, right? So it's not linear, it's going to be quite flat in the middle, and then it's going to quite steeply approach one at the edge. So it's very well defined, very close to the edge, it's very poorly defined, most of the middle. Um, but to be honest, like I said, this is a choice. You could pick anything that has the right uh, symmetry, right? So R squared, R cubed, or some, something. Yes? And there are Question. So you said that the akin is like a spring which wants to come to the original size there. Uh -huh. Why, if it's not anchored on the side, all the clusters move and it contracts? Why does akin want to do that? Okay. Well, because they I mean, they don't move instantaneously. Is the main reason, right? So if I had, imagine I had a row of springs, right? And everything can move instantaneously, and I magically change the rest length of all these row, this row of springs, you're right, it just wants to be shorter, so everything just moves in, and I have a shorter spring. But if I now sink this thing in water or whatever, then it's going to take time to readjust, right? And this kind of thing means that I have to define these things dynamically as they go, and it also means that I can't just say, oh, trim. The other thing comes from the fact that I said before that it might not be isotropic. Right? So, for it, I mean, this, this is obviously an unrealistic example that I'm going to give you, but let's just say this length wants to expand, this length wants to stay the same length, and this length wants to shrink. Now, out of three of these springs, because of the action of the myosin, they can't all obtain their rest length. Right? So, this is why we don't say this is what the length of the spring is, because the myosin is shrinking these springs. So, this is what it wants to be, because the myosin is pulling as if it wants to keep going. Right, but it might, in, so, such as in that example I gave there, it might not be able to obtain the, the kind of where it wants to be. So essentially, it's just, there's always a little bit of stress in some of these strings. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, and kind of the same question, where do you put the fact that it's an active system that is constantly so, uh, well, I, once I explain this equation, I, I won't explain it all because I can see that it's it's, it's nasty. Then I can I can comment on that because it essentially comes in. Okay, so we start. So, uh, well, as you rightly pointed out, currently I've, I've described an equilibrium system. I haven't described an active system. I've just said, okay, the springs are different lengths, right? So, and this is going to be the length of the springs. So, for example, if I look at this this kind of link here, its length, its new length is going to be given like this. So this is the original length, and it's going to be multiplied by some parameter, 
right? And the way, sorry, some, some, some factor, and I've just, so here's that S, the order parameter, here's that P that's there. The way I constructed this equation is I didn't say, oh, I know, this is what the equation should be. This will give me what I want. Now, in fact, what I did is I used a trick in physics that's just called an analysis of symmetry. And I just said, okay, what are the simplest possible terms that I'm allowed to include? Right? I said, what are the symmetries essentially in the same way that with the Poincare Hopf theorem I said there has to be a defect? You can do a similar kind of pro process here where I say, okay, P is allowed to come in here, that's P dot L, but it has to be squared because P is nematic. Right? So I, that means that P and minus P are the same. So, so this term is dictated by the symmetry of the system. I didn't come up with it in any special way, I just wrote down what I was allowed. And, and essentially, of course, there are infinitely many terms you could write down, but I just took the simplest. Three, I guess. I mean, this, this is no term, obviously. And these are the two simplest terms, including these two things that I identified. So, as you said, if I just change the rest of the springs, it's not active. Two things I'll say about this. These coefficients, so this one obviously will just shrink things, right? So I actually can ignore that first at all. But this is essentially whether the edge shrinks by a term. In fact, I'm going to introduce this in a minute. I can make any of these parameters time dependent. So if I say, well, my spring doesn't just instantly want to be shorter, the minus and actually have to walk along the actin, I would say, okay, well, this is some function of time. And the spring gets slowly shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, okay, so this is essentially what I just explained there. This, this term here is going to identify the fact that if this spring is, is, is the dot product of P and L, so you see P is kind of diagonal there, so these are nearly the same angle. So this term is going to be very large. So this is going to be important for that spring. However, for this spring, right, which is right next to it, so P has the same orientation, but now they're almost perpendicular. So now this term is going to be very small, right? So, so this also comes back to what I said to Charlotte, that these two, these two bonds are going to want to have different lengths because they have different orientations, right? And this is essentially what... Uh, at once. So this is what I was saying with the tour earlier. These are my three parameters. These are essentially the only knobs in the model that I can turn if I want to try and investigate what's going on. Right, so I have this phi, which controls whether they've got a spiral or an asteroid or a, or a vortex defect at the center. I've got this parameter here, it's psi, and this says it doesn't depend on P, right? So this doesn't really care about the orientation, it's just does the edge shrink or expand relative to the middle? Right? And then I've got lambda, which cares about P, and that says, okay, this one that's kind of perpendicular, whereas this one's kind of parallel, is this one going to shrink or expand relative to one that is perpendicular? Okay? So, and, and as I said, it's not that I designed this model to be this way, this is just including what the simplest terms are. And this is what we have. Okay, so that's over for now, at least. Um, so, okay, I've I described a, a, a model, and we can just see what it looks like. Okay, so here I'm going to pick two, two parameters. So I, the, the isotropic stress is psi, I've set to zero. So this is going to be, you can kind of visualize what this might look like by looking at this. Okay, so phi is equal to pi by two. So it's a vortex. So the red lines are my, uh, are my P field. Lambda is positive, which means these red lines, on average, all want to get longer. However, the black lines don't. They're springs that don't change in length. So if I cut this kind of out of the board here, so it was made of rubber and it somehow had some little engines in there that could expand along the red lines, this probably won't stay flat. Does anyone want to guess what shape this is going to be? You're not allowed to guess if you come from my office. Does anyone want to have a guess? If I, if I take this, made it out of rubber, but then what make the red lines want to go longer? Charlotte, did you just guess? I, somebody said something. The last one of the introduction slide. I think that was Poppadon, which is a new food, so I'm not. All right, and I see you. It was like, I'm going to say something, also a curve or something. Uh, a curve. A, a curve. A curve, a curve. Okay, so, so I'll just tell you in the next of this tour, we refer to cups and domes as the same thing, like a bowl shape. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, okay, well, that's enough guesses for now. And uh, we can just simulate it and look, right? So this is the vortex defect. So, you see, what's, what's kind of happening, it kind of makes sense when you think about it. This red line around the edge wants to be really, really long, so it's kind of, in order to be long enough, it's had to buckle out a plane, right? And this is a saddle, a saddle shape, which is, geometrically, geometrically speaking, the exact opposite of your guess. Yeah. Oh, no. 
You know, I'm not that far. <laughs> I mean, like on the spectrum of right to wrong. <laughs> but I want to see this one, really. Okay, so now, okay, I've, all I've done is I've changed the sign of five. So now we've changed to an aster defect. So again, same experiment. We're going to make this out of rubber and include some little machines to make these red lines get longer, whereas the black lines, the kind of uh, concentric circles, all the stay the same length. Round two, double or nothing. What do you reckon? <laughs> no, I cannot, I cannot say it's going to be a settlement sheet because then I'll be wrong again. <laughs> so, so your I keep on, I keep on moving. The stick with cup or bowl or, or dome, and he's right, okay? And again, it kind of makes sense, right? The edge, this perimeter, now wants to stay exactly the same length. But in the middle, well, I don't know, I shouldn't say, I should say radially, it wants to get longer, right? So now, for in the distance between the middle and the edge, I've got loads of extra material I've got to try and fit in, right? And in order to fit in that, it's going to pop out of the center. Okay, so as I said, there's only a couple of parameters, and you can just explore more. Right, so there's essentially this phi can be it could be a spiral or it can be an aster or a vortex. These are the these are the isotropic terms that I talked about that you have to include. Right, so this is just whether it expands or contracts relative to the middle. Right, and then here are these diagrams to show everything you get, and here are all of the different sheets you can get. So essentially, through this model, this is every sheet you can get. Okay, and if you've got a keen eye, you might see that they fall into three classes. Right, so we've got these two here, which are flat. Pretty much flat. So they started off as a flat sheet and they ended as a flat sheet. These are the spirals. These are a very particular spiral, I should say. These are spirals with an angle of pi by six. Okay, I've got three sheets which are uh, sandals, oh, sorry, dome shaped, right? So these are kind of these dome or cup shapes and they're kind of bolted in the middle in the orange. And I've got three sheets that are saddle shaped, right? To varying degrees. I know this one's slightly less, right? This one's a bit better. Okay, so everything falls into three parameters. Um, and I want to be able to, to decide, I want to be able to predict this in the future, right? I want to know why, why is it falling into these shapes? So now we have our next set of equations. Again, this is one of those slides that you can kind of ignore most of. So this is the energy of an elastic sheet. It looks complicated, but we can simplify it by expanding the terms, and it gets worse. But I'm going to tell you, what we really need to know is there's two terms, right? The first one, H, is now the thickness of the sheet. And there's a straight energy term that depends on this construction, which I'll explain in a second. And then the thickness cubed, and then there's a bending energy term, which depends on this construction. Okay, so imagine I have some region, right? And I'm going to draw lines on it so you can tell when it's skewed. If I now stretch it, right, I'm stretching it in planes, right? So I'm changing the shape of these squares into diamonds by kind of stretching it and shearing it and stuff. This is, but it's not bent in any way. So this energy is all going to be captured by this term, right? However, if I just bend it, so now these squares still remain squares, I've just curved my sheet over, this energy is all going to be contained by this term, right? So now I think back to these actuators. So I've got this system, I've got this topological defect, and these things, these things in play that want to push or pull or stretch, right? That is all going to be this term. Right? There's nothing in those actuators that wants to bend the sheet. They're not trying to bend regions, they're just trying to extend in plane. Right? So everything I've seen shown you so far should be explained by this part of the equation. So I'm essentially, I mean I will simulate the other part, but I'm going to kind of ignore it for now. So what is this in the middle? Right? So this is a fairly common way that you see energies in physics, right? Essentially it says that I have some state of the system G and it has some state that it wants to be, and this energy is zero when g equals g bar, right? And it's, it's not zero otherwise, right? So essentially, you could think of this as being the length of a spring, and the length of a spring wants to be. When they're the same, the energy goes away, but if g is bigger or smaller than g bar, then it's going to be, uh, it's going to have energy, right? That's all it means. Right, but I have to, so g is essentially a, a mathematical construction that describes the current shape of the sheet, right? So uh, this is just a reminder of our, of our kind of parameters. And G bar is something that describes the state of the sheet it wants to be. Okay, again, this looks quite complicated. We've got these kind of, you know, sub, uh, indices and stuff. But if you recall the, the version of this that I had earlier, right, in the springs, you can see there's some similarities. One plus xi x, one plus xi s, plus lambda s, plus lambda s. P times p, this is going to have p times p, right? It's going to p squared. So I actually wrote this equation using exactly the same thing, right? Just an expansion of symmetry. They're saying 
I don't really care what's going on in there. I'm not going to worry too much about any of the kind of biochemistry or anything. I'm just going to write down what mathematically is the simplest way to describe what I've got. Same technique as I used before. Okay, and this is what I'm going to get. Okay, so now I can describe this energy, right? But now I'm going to try and find a way to minimize that energy. And I'm going to use what's called the Monte Carlo method, or wiggling. Um, so I don't, maybe some of you have heard kind of, uh, or maybe some of you have used these techniques before, but essentially that's what it means. It means it wiggles. I wiggle it. I start with a flat sheet, and I'm going to prod it, shake it, twist it, and bend it, and I'm going to see when the energy gets minimized. That's all it is. Right? It's, it's the equivalent of trying to find out how many sides are on a dice by just rolling it over and over again. I'm kind of doing that until I get a good answer. Okay? So at first I have to define what my, bend, what my wiggles are. Right, so it's got like three dance moves, right? One is kind of like a twist, right? So I can twist the boundary relative to the center, right? And there's red and blue are kind of positive and negative twists. I can stretch, right? So I can take a bit of the edge and pull it out, push it in relative to the center. And I can also bend it, like prod it up or down, right? So take a bit of the edge and just lift it up or, or press it down, right? So these are all just kind of dance moves that my, uh, that my sheet is gonna Going to perform, I'm going to randomly get it to dance. Every time it finishes a dance move, I'm going to say, okay, what's the energy now? Is it lower or higher than it was before? And if it's lower, I'm probably going to be like, that's a good dance move, let's keep it. Right? It's that simple. Right? So this is, this is one that Aurelian got right. Okay? This is extensile axis. This wants to be dome shaped. Okay? And then I just apply these perturbations to it. Right? It wiggles, it wiggles, it wiggles. It's kind of, but at some point, the, the algorithm starts to learn. It's like, Oh, I know the edges need to come up, and then at some point it's like ah, I found where I'm meant to be, right? It's a dome, it's actually a cup shape, right? But uh, so this 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 is uh, this dome style, sorry, it's dome or cup shaped surface. So it's found the correct surface. So this is pretty good evidence that our energy that we described describes our initial experiment, or sorry, it's our initial simulation. Okay. So this is the results sheet I, I showed you before, right? And uh, remember, we had these three categories. So these, these are the ones that I showed you before. So I'm going I'm to replace these with the new sheets that the new method finds. Um, and you should see, I mean, if you just pick one to look at, and after I change it, oh, you should see it's roughly the same, right? So the orange ones are still saddle-shaped. Oh, wait, they're oh. <laughs> OK. I've blotted these wrong. Yeah, well, there's a mistake there. <laughs> Okay, well, it should be, the orange ones are still dome-shaped. These two are obviously right at this and this, and it's been switched, I think. Um, and the pink ones are all saddle-shaped, up to, up to my own mistake, right? And the green ones are flat. But you can also see how, however, if we look at these green ones, we can see that when it was doing its dance, it's done almost entirely twist moves, right? This is twisted one way, and this is twisted the other way, okay? But this is good. This means that we really understand how the sheet works. So we can use this theory to try and probe what the real mechanism behind what it takes these surfaces is. Okay, and I'm going to start by asking a very simple question. What is the circumference of a circle? There's a diagram here for anyone who's forgotten how this might work. 2 pi r, right? Who knew that equation? I, yeah, I'm not going to patronize you and ask you to raise hands, but I'm assuming everyone's going to say, like, yeah, I know. So let's say I come to your office one day with a piece of paper and I say, a really big piece of paper and a piece of string, and I say, prove this to me. You know, plot a load of circles, prove it to me, right? And instead of saying I give you a seven meter long piece, or about a meter wide piece of paper, and you, you measure the boundary of the circle, and you measure it for different radii, and you say, okay, yeah, seems about right, okay? We've got a gradient of two pi, two pi r, you're good. And I say, I'm not satisfied yet. Go outside with an even longer piece of string, or <laughs> maybe a car, do it again, right? One kilometer, seven kilometer, gradient stays the same. I'm like, no, 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 not good enough. What I want you to do is I want you to get in an aeroplane. And I want you to take off. And I want you to fly a certain distance from where you started, turn 90 degrees, keep your starting position in your right hand window, and just fly a huge circle around where you started. Right? And this is now 5,000 kilometer radius circle. And your results are starting to look wrong. OK? So why is this, right? If I, if I get you to do a really big circle, right? So this is, this is like, oh, you know, you have to go a long way from where you started, but your circle now is a circumference of zero. So, you know, it's, it's actually not that bad in some ways, right? You didn't have to go that far. But this is, uh, 
you know, I, I wouldn't be that mean. I'd probably get you to stop somewhere around like 10,000 kilometers. Okay, so why is this? I mean, you've probably figured it out. It's not too complicated. We live on a sphere, right? So if I start at the North Pole, as I walk from the North Pole to the edge, and I'm somewhere around about here, I'm like, yeah, I mean, it kind of looks like a radius in a circle. I go a bit further and I realize, well, for this circle, which has a radius from here to here, or well, sorry, diameter from here to here, I'm having to walk all the way from the North Pole all the way down here, which is quite a long way, right? So now I see that, well, the, the circumference doesn't seem long enough for how far I walked, right? If I go past the equator, I see that now these circles are starting to get smaller, right? And of course, the equator has a, a distance of 40,000 kilometers. A couple of facts in here. And, uh, and then, yeah, of course, I mean, once you start to get down close to the South Pole, eventually, no matter what direction you walk from the North Pole, you're going to end up at the South Pole, and you're going to turn to your right, and be like, well, I'm already where I started. You know what I mean? So, so the, the radius of the circumference is going to get to zero. OK, if, however, you come back to me with, uh, with having done this experiment, and you say, I got this, then, you know, I've got a question for you. Right, so this is, this is my test for flat earthers. So if you, if you don't know how to test, because you've never been to space, you don't own a rocket, this is probably the um, you, I mean, obviously, you need to own an airplane, but it's easier. OK, so we can kind of apply the same logic to our system. OK, so the perimeter, again, this is why, we, this is why it's important to get this new description using these Gs and stuff. We can write down what the perimeter wants to be. What is the rest length of the perimeter? Okay. We can write down what the rest length of the radius is going to be, how far the gel wants it to be to go from the center to the edge. Right? And we just take the radius of the two. So if this was a circle, P would be 2 times pi times rho. Right? So this bit would be 1, and kappa would be 0. Okay? But if it's, if it's not going to be a circle, if you're on a sphere, for example, and P is going to be too small, what you want, kappa is going to be above 1. Right? So this is what you're going to essentially get. So this one, this is what I hope all of you will come back when you finish this homework. Next week, I'm going to this plot. OK? If anyone comes back with this plot, I'm going to be quite surprised. But I might say, you're not going far enough. Like, I think these conspiracy theorists, they need to work a little harder on this conspiracy theory. I want to see someone come back with the blue curve, which is going to be that we live on a saddle, right? This is, uh, this is essentially what I spent the morning doing <laughs> in Photoshop. OK, so this, this is the curve. You'll get into this experiment. If you lived on a, a saddle, which is essentially a Pringle shape, you'll get this blue curve, which is kappa is less than zero. OK, so now, oh, I just think got this mistake again. But you can see kappa just depends on these parameters. So I can figure it out. And whenever psi is zero, psi is positive, and everything else is zero, then I'm going to get kappa is less than zero. So this should be a saddle, right? This should be a saddle. And this should be a saddle based on these parameters. This should be a dome, 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 and we've got the two flat ones. This also lets us realize why this is flat. Essentially, at pi by six, this spiral, exactly the amount of aster and vortex that meets against the amount of the spiral, exactly balanced. So it just wants to twist, and it doesn't want to become either of these, because kappa here actually equals zero. Right? It just dissipates. OK, so I made a lot of promises in my title, so now we can move on to some of those. So other applications of this theory, before we go back to developmental biology, who knows what pop dumps are? Most of you should, right? It's in the industry. They're really good, right? If you go to a decent restaurant, and you have a starter, and you say, oh, give me some pop dumps, some, you know, some chopped onions, some chutney, I don't know what else we've got in here. And they're like, bring your platter of pop dumps like this. These are made of uh, some kind of flour, exactly, and you fry them. Right? And, and they cook and they're kind of crispy. Right? You can see they're kind of crinkled, but here, because this restaurant is very, very good and they, they care about their craft, these are all, on average, flat. They stack well. Right? It's giving you a pile of problems. You're like, yeah, they stack by the flat pink shoe. Okay? Here is some amateur from recipeland.com in 2015. Sean, I'm going to call you out for shoddy poppadons. Um, no, but so, so Sean's poppadons here. You see, they're far from flat, right? They, they've got this crinkle at the edge, right? And then, like, kind of a dome in the middle. What's happened, Sean? It's all gone wrong. And what's happened is his, his problems have cooked unevenly at the wrong speed in different places, right? And here, this German guy, who was actually trying to make, uh, he was trying to make fat-free poppadoms or something. This German guy, he's, he's had a complete nap, 
and the cooked is actually from the outside in, and the end is still, the middle is now completely fat, the edge has got these waves around the edge, a bit like what we saw in Anne's experiment. See, you know, you know, it all leads back. So we look at our theory again. So this is the poppadom. This, this, this isn't got any biological actuators. It's got no, I mean, it's it, obviously it is made of some kind of polymer, but the polymer the orientation doesn't matter, right? So that p-term goes away. I'm like, oh, I'm going to sit, lambda is equal to zero, because this isn't some network of kind of long rigid polymers, right? So this goes away. Now I only have, so I'm going to ignore this term. This says whether the whole thing shrinks or not. And this is, I just have this term to worry about. So, from my previous results and from the kappa, I know that if epsilon is greater than zero, I'm going to get kappa less than zero, which means I'm going to have waves around the edge. Okay? And I stick that into my, uh, into my model and I tweak the parameters a little bit to get the waves at roughly the same, uh, you know, wavelength, etc. And we get something that looks the same. So, this is what's happened. I, I, can, I, can, I can email Sean. Oh, no, this isn't Sean. I can email this German guy. I'll get Carson to email them in German. Um, and I'll say to him, I'll be like, look, I don't know if you realize, but this coefficient is positive, so you have to be really careful you cook the poppadons even, right? Or else you're gonna have this issue. And then somebody on the internet is gonna find it, make out of you, right? What, about, what happens if I live in another dimension and my poppadons shrink as they cook, right? This isn't what poppadons do, but I say, well, what happens if I make this negative? Well, I can actually do this, right? As I said, this is actually just this term here, Right, this first term just makes the whole thing shrink or contract. So I can make this negative by essentially saying, well, what if I only cook the pop in the middle, right? And I cancel this negative out by having a, a large term at the beginning, right? So this is the same as saying, what happens if the pop comes only in the middle? So this obviously is going to give capital greater than zero, it's going to give you a dome shape, right? So as we all know, when you cook, and as we saw from Sean and the general guy, when you cook your poppadoms, the most common mistake is to cook them from the edge first, right? Because when things heat up, the heat has to diffuse in, right? However, with a little bit of trickery this weekend, I managed to cook a poppadom only in the middle, right? So now we have this kind of hat shape. So it's, it's clearly warm here, well, this bit cooked a little bit, but now it's got this bulge in the middle, which is the same shape as this, because I sent you. This is what poppadoms will look like when chefs are bad in the other dimension. Right, let's see it. Okay. So we have our first application mark there. Very nice. Okay, but let's, let's go back to our original uh, kind of application or original inspiration. So this is the video I showed you of Anne's experiment, right? It has these waves around the edge. So we already know, well, okay, there's more to this experiment than what we had before, actually. If you make these very thin, these thin sheets, we get these waves around the edge. This is exactly what we see. We see this is a saddle, down three peaks and three troughs, okay? We make it a bit thicker, this kind of looks more just curved. It's got two peaks and two troughs. So it's still a saddle, but it's kind of less saddle than this one. And if we make it really thick, we then go to this dome shape, right? So something's going on here. It's changed between the different thicknesses. So I could say to you, say, oh, well, you know, this is a dome, so this has to be uh, negative, and this is a saddle, so this has to be positive, or something like that. But I'm not going to do that here. Because in the same way that it's made this theory by looking at the symmetry and just writing down what I could, there's nothing in here that has the correct symmetry to depend on the thickness of the jet, right? These are all dimensionless parameters, right? None of these have the units of millimeters or micrometers or whatever. So it'd be very strange for me to include that in there unless I had some other legacy of common one, which I don't know if it's exactly. Okay, so I have to think of something else. So to look for a clue for what this might be, do, I ask them this question. Do the domes always look the same way? Right? Are they always domes or are they always cups? She said they're always domes, right? So this is essentially going to be described by the fact that H, this is the mean cur curvature, is greater than zero. Right? If it was a cup, this would be negative, but she said no, always positive, always this way. So when they buckle, they always rise in the middle and fall at the edge. Okay? So we've seen this H before one time, and it was in this term here. So you remember this is the energy of a sheet has got this strain part and a bending part, okay? So I have a strain part and a bending part. Before I define this reference metric here, this is what the, the kind of the little actuators, your little biological motors want the surface to be, right? But here I say, okay, what happens if this H naught is not equal to zero? It says that it wants it best, right? So 
And oh, I mentioned it before, these have a prefactor, right? This is times by the thickness of the gel, this is times by the thickness of the gel cube. So when the thick gel is very, very thin, this term is going to be very, very, very small. Okay, so we can essentially ignore it and we can say, well, the energy is going to be roughly equal to this, and the reference metric is going to decide what shape the gel is going to be. However, when the opposite case, when the gel is very thick, this term is going to be much bigger than this term, and I can say, oh, I'm going to ignore this, and I have something like this, and now this spontaneous curvature is going to decide which shape the gel is going to be. Okay, so I have a transition that's controlled by thickness between strain driven and bend driven buckling. Okay. So, why do they always buckle the same way? Why is that compatible with this H, but not compatible with, uh, with the uh, reference metric? Well, the answer is gravity, okay? So I said that here's the example I had before of something with mean curvature, but obviously I have the opposite version, which is something with, with, uh, with the other mean curvature, right? And these are not the same, right? This one has a mean curvature that is negative, and this one has one that's positive, because I have a button. So this essentially says something has to be different between the top and the bottom of the sheet of this, of this actomycin gel. Okay, so if I look at it, we're going to say, right, this is the very beginning of my experiment, right, when, when, before it started contracting, and when you just pipette in a fluid with all the components, and they're all still diffusing, right? They're actually diffusing under the influence of gravity. Now, usually, in this kind of situation, we'd ignore it, because these things, you know, a, a, a myosin doesn't weigh much. Right? And at the temperature of a room, it has more than enough energy to overcome gravity. But it's the only thing in the experiment with the correct symmetry to kind of break this, uh, this imbalance between these two. So there must be some component that ever so slightly sediments. I can see skepticism of Charlotte's face. So what I should say, this is a broken symmetry argument. So unless... Well, you think it's rather surface interaction of gravity. They're very important. They are free floating in water, not seeing They're in a droplet. A droplet. And I, as, as far as I'm aware, a lot of care has been taken to, to remove surface interactions. One thing I will say about that, though, as I said, this argument comes from gravity. So if Anne, who I think is watching this talk, says, oh, you know what? Let me show you some point. Maybe there is some interaction. I can replace this part of the slide. The story remains the same. In the theory, it's still just that. Something has broken the symmetry between positive and negative, whether that's interaction with the, with the slide or interaction with the uh, with gravity. But as we currently understand the experiment, the only thing with this symmetry is gravity, right? So that's all it could be so far. And what time scale is the experiment phase? So I'm actually not sure. I mean, the first stage is very is relatively quick, and I should say. You don't need a, it's, I mean, I've drawn this here, it's like dark at the bottom and light at the top. We looked at the experiments. This, I mean, if you do the theory on what the actual change in color between here and here would be, if I was to plot accurately, like theoretically predicting the change in color due to gravity, the sedimentation of any of these things, no one will be able to tell. They just like, yeah, it's a green block. Okay, so it's, it's really, like I say, you only need something to be different, but that difference doesn't have to be big. And from the theory, it is vanishingly small, which is why everyone ignores it, right? When you think of like, uh, you know, you dissolve some sugar in your tea, you don't think, oh, you know, after it's fully dissolved, it's, it's going to be slightly sugary, more sugary at the bottom because sugar's a little heavier than water. You just think, no, the whole thing's going to taste the same because you can't detect you know, the effect of gravity on a dissolved bit of sugar is so small that the temperature of the tea is going to give it enough energy to overcome any effect that will really have. So it's almost indetectable. So this would be our way of detecting it, detecting something so small. Well, you know, too small. <laughs> okay, so this breaks symmetry, right? So now we can say that one of these is not right because of gravity or anything else in the experiment that might break symmetry. So we just pick a value. So again, I'm not, I'm not gonna care what, what this is, right? And this again comes down to the fact that I actually don't care whether it's surface interactions or gravity or whatever. I'm just going to pick a value. I'm just going to pick a value that's not zero and that is greater than zero. Okay, so this is the transition we had before. Oops. We've got thin, thin gels, a sal shape, thick gels, a dome shape. Right? As before, I said this is very thin. We're going to have strain driven. So I just pick G to give me a salad. I say, okay, well, I know what this is going to do because I've just picked. My components, which the G gives me a sound. 
However, when it's very, very thick, g no longer occurs in this equation, only h. So, and I've already picked h to give me a double. And right? I'm going to get some transition between the two, those simulators. Okay, that's all I did. That comes from the, from the, from the real theory of, of uh, elastic shells. But what about this idea where I had this like spring was kind of trying to simulate the material, right? How we might design an actual active, active soft robot. Well, I have to introduce something like this, right? This term essentially does the same thing. It says stuff on the bottom either shrinks or expands faster or slower than stuff on the top. Okay, and you get exactly the same results for thin and thick gels. This is all very good. Okay, last slide. Ooh. So this is something, this is the paper that came out recently, right? So these guys in, uh, in Israel um, talking about how Hydra, this, this organism, uh, kind of changed itself. So it's not this Hydra in the comic books, it's this one, right? It's this little kind of wormy type creature with these tentacles. But what's cool about Hydra is you can simply take one of these, put it in a blender, and you should have all the blended Hydra, you stick it back in some food, and it'll grow itself back into this shape. Right? And the way it does that first, it forms a sphere, like a blob, right? And then, just like a soft robot, it's going to have this kind of network of fibers on the surface, which then push and pull against each other to organize itself. And here we see in this video, there's actually two defects. This is a minus a half and a plus half, and eventually they're going to merge together. Right? So now I have a sphere right, with this vector field on its surface, Right? Exactly the same things are happening that happened in our experiment, but now we're in a different geometry. Right? And what's very cool about this is that they see when the thing starts to relax, you have to, because of the point very hot you have to have some defects. So you get a plus one defect here, and this is the site of the map. You can see this green protein is localized, the plus one defect. So the presence of the defects on the surface of this organism actually helps organize where the components go when it, uh, when it kind of uh, grows back into an organism. And, this, uh, and on the other end, we've got uh, a pair of minus a half, and this these kind of localized where the foot of the, the hydra is going to be. So our model is an OCD. So I'm going to quickly whip through this. So we can also do it on a stair. So on a stair, you have to have two topological defects. Again, because of the one correct hot So essentially, if I had like latitude line, or sorry, latitude lines, longitude lines, or some kind of spiral combination of the both of the two, right, I have to have a defect in the North Pole and the South Pole. Again, this is the same reason that babies have to have, well, not just babies, all of us have to have a defect in there. Okay, right, and there we did, we essentially designed fire in the same way. And we just do exactly the same thing with our, with our simulations, right? And we see that, okay, if I have this system here and the lines want to grow, it's going to grow vertically or it's going to feel shrink, it's going to shrink vertically. Well, it's very cool, right? If I have this system here, so a pair of vortices, so they want to shrink, it shrinks in the middle. So topologically, this might not look like a bacteria, right? But topologically, when you have the FTS ring around the center of a bacteria, that is the same as having a, top, a vortex at, at the two ends, right? And this pinches in the middle, okay? And uh, this is actually my favorite. I mean, if, if these extend, it wants to get a saddle on both sides. But of course, you've got two saddles on, on either side of your sphere, and they want to essentially pack against each other like this. A bit, a bit like the way two pringles pack against each other um, so yeah, that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about today. This is where we will go next. We will take this. We will try and understand the hydra. The hydra has more. It has a it has a well defined network of defects on its surface, more than just two plus one defects. We will just plug that into our model and see what happens. And see if we get the same shape for the hydra. Um, so obviously, I didn't do this work alone. So here at Geneva, I worked closely with my uh, supervisor Carson Cruz, but also the guys in my uh, group help, especially Nico Carlos. We discuss with a lot, and the experiments were all done by uh, Anne Bernheim's group in the Ben Gurion University in Israel. And these are two of the students that I think actually did a lot of the experiments. And I think that's pretty much me out of time. So, are there any questions? Yes. So it's true. If if you talk about isotropic stuff, you don't need an order parameter. Essentially, the order parameter comes from the fact that you have to have a topological defect. Topological defect comes from the fact you have 
orientation. If it, no, you don't. So if you have an isotopic tail, you don't have to have that tail. So it's true. I mean, it, so I mean, you still have rotational symmetry. So that order parameter would probably the first order terms would look the same, but they don't have to be there in the same way that they do in when you have flexibility with orientation symmetry. And I have a second question. Yeah, you use more or less the same thing. Did you change the profile of the other one? You have this S R R square. So the, the main way that comes into it is so you know how I said like when you have a spiral, it's flat. If the spiral is just at the right angle. And that angle we work out from this kappa parameter. So I didn't write them here, but the actual when, when you actually write down the equation for that kappa, kappa it's long and complicated. And then the, the nature of that S comes in there. So it becomes like a functional integral. So essentially, the, whatever, what, everything I've done here is for S equals R squared. If you change it to S equals R cubed, for example, you get essentially the same stuff, but the point at which it crosses over is not pi by 6. It might be yeah, pi by 2, right? And so whatever you pick there, you're going to get some different answer. Um, but the broad, essentially, if you have a difference between the middle and the edge, which is what you're allowed by your symmetry, um, whether it's isotropic or not, right, in your rotation symmetry, um, then you're going to get these two things. It's just an absolute, like, where exactly it goes from spiral to, to flat to, to, to saddle, that transition will depend on whatever choice you make. Maybe, maybe a, uh, a question about the it's fine. <laughs> the first one is can you can you from just the buckle shape at the edge differentiate between the contractile gels and the extensile? So this, I mean, mainly by geometry, as you, as you can see from I mean, I can bring up the slide, right? Uh, I'll bring it over down the same thing. Um, so as you can see from this, obviously, I have like three saddles and I have three domes. Right, but this dome is not exactly the same. See, the, the, the one in the top row, the dome is kind of quite level, right? And whereas this one is really quite curved over. So the nature of these, and, and that's, I mean, these are just one realization. Essentially, this, this kind of setup will always lead to a, a more kind of harsh dome. And these will eventually actually start to curl around on themselves. So, yes, in a way, you can look at a, a, a gel and say, like, oh, you know, it's a dome, but really just, it's probably going to be something like this, right? But at the same time, I mean, these experiments, obviously, you look at one gel, and you could look like any of those. You'd have to look at a thousand. No. The other thing, obviously, that there is other terms you could add, right? Like I said, we, we did this by symmetry, and we just said, okay, these are the simplest possible terms. So you could add other terms that might change things. You can't remove these terms, and the other terms you could add would be smaller, but the difference between this saddle, sorry, this saddle and this saddle, that might be the kind of small difference that does change. Mm -hmm. So, so in the, when I said we have this transition between thick and thin gels in our system, for that I had to, I mean, for the sake of the talk, I chose a reference metric that I knew would be a saddle and a thin shape. But as you can see from here, there are actually three correct choices, mm -hmm. right? And we've done all three, we get largely the same answer for all three. I mean, like, they, they vary in the trends. But uh, but yeah, so so going back the other way, it's quite hard. But I mean, let's take these kind of symmetry uh, type uh, type arguments. I mean, they're incredibly powerful, and you can just be like, oh, I don't I, I don't need to understand any bioequivalent of Brinkley's theory. You can come up with a very functional theory. It's the same way in which you would derive like Navier's theory, which we all agree is pretty good. Um, but then you know you can always add more. Based on your understanding and based on how you do. Did you have two questions? Yes. And the second question is I mean, it's something I did not understand very so uh -huh. it's just a clarification. When, when Anne starts the experiment, there's no topology for the Well, oh, so well, 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 I mean, my understanding is just that they, they make a very thin shell uh, in, uh, of, of acting, actomizing in the circular cast. So, no, no, no. well, or do they do? Is there a way that they can form a topological defect in the center? Or is the topological defect uh, spontaneously arising from the fact that it constricts? So, the topological defect spontaneously arises from the concrete material. So, so because, because 
because it's hyperintentional symmetry, you you have to have a tolerance to zk. Or you could have no order parameters. You could also have your parameter zero. This is not what I generally see. You see G, because of the, obviously you, you can look close to the experiment. Yeah, she sees generally tangential line, which would imply, imply that Anne's experiments lie in this scenario, right? In, sorry, tangential alignment, this scenario, right? Because she sees a saddle, but she sees tangential alignment. This might confuse you. You might say, wait, 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 wait. Lambda is puzzled here, but I thought you said these things trap and muscles. They do, right? Because lambda is a dimensionless thing. This actually just defines the nature of the anisotropy. So you can say, okay, lambda is positive, but then the other terms, you can make them negative, so the whole thing shrinks. However, the red lines want to, want to stay a little bit more. Um, but there may be an experiment instead, because I guess they're casting it into. Oh, and yeah, that's what I was going to say. Sorry. Sorry. It's, in that it's, sort of it's, it's a couple of components um, dissolved, non polymerized. So you have a solution that contains you know, the ATP, the uh, cross linkers, the minus and the active. And, and when they first put them in the experiment, that's the best of my knowledge, it really is just a water problem. Right? So at that point, there is no. This P is not well defined and this phi is not well defined because there's no polymers yet. So they start to form. And of course, as they form, as soon as they start to kind of, uh, as soon as the network starts to curve, they can also start to contract. So definitely there is probably some interaction there. But as I said, like the rotational symmetry is what gives you the topological defects. And this is just uh, topologically there, which you essentially can't get around. In the same way, I mean, if, if I put these chalks in, in, a, in a circular drum, and say, okay, I'm going to make sure they lie on the edge, you know, because the chalks are on the thin, I'm going to have that. Yeah, but what, what I was thinking was to make a gigantic sheet of uh, polymer and then cut it into circular pieces. And then you would lose the organization from the beginning, would be. Well, then, because you start off with something rotationally symmetric, right? yeah. if you cut something that isn't around the center, yeah. you end up with something that's no longer rotationally yeah. symmetric, so you don't have to have a top of the either. Yeah, right. you can you can probably get it big enough and get it small enough so that you don't have order. But okay, sure, but then but then all of the terms disappear. Yeah. I mean the other thing you, you could do, which I would like to do, which is quite interesting, if you take a sheet and you cut out the middle, you've removed the top of the defect. But, and you're allowed to do this by the concrete hops here because you've added a boundary. So now you have a boundary around the edge, and you have a boundary around the hole. Okay. And then you would get different results again. And I, I don't know what you would get there. I mean, you could also, I mean, again, a bit like the Nambu Stokes, like equation two, this is based on symmetry. You can apply it to almost anything you can think of that has the properties you want to model. So, I mean, I've been modeling tennis balls using this for casting, because I thought, oh, it'd be funny if I could kind of get, you know, the tennis ball has the white line here. Yeah. I was like, oh, see so what happens with that. Um, obviously, with colors, I'm going to apply it to Hydra, but really, you could do anything. Right, you could, you, I mean, you, you could take a photo of your face, translate it to an order parameter, and print it on one of these, and then see what the shape she makes, right? If you want, right, for Christmas. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, there's a lot of freedom. And oh, the thing I was going to say about that, like, you could also see something really strange, like a Mobius strip, right? I mean, you can't have self intersecting um, stuff on this, at least without a lot. I mean, the theory you could, but the simulation could need a bit more uh, thinking. But you know, a Mobius strip or something topologically weird that a torus. You can also do bulk materials, I should say, right? So if you just want to do a block that has enough, if it's not a 2D surface, mm -hmm. right? Like a feed 3D block, like power system, mm -hmm. right? If you if, if you if you want to do that, because one defect in the center, but it has an order parameter everywhere, the 3D block, again, you can just use the system and it can it, right? Again, I have the mind we can all the symmetry that are required. Anything else? Oh, done? No. Okay. Oh, talking to you. Ah. Um, I oh. have two questions by a computer. Um, the one is that if, uh, if in your uh, theory you could uh, predict the forces on these uh, different uh, shapes, configurations, uh, by, for instance, I don't know, um, comparing the shape with uh, uh, with a similar shape, but with uh, some um, element of volume that has been removed uh, from the disk, for example. If you could, uh, in some sense, uh, estimate the forces in, in, in each of these disks. 
So for that, you, so this system with the, with the springs, you can, because you know the forces, because you know what the force on each spring is. So, uh, so there you can directly extract it, right? And I can tell you now, because I had a look, the forces for, the, for this set of sheets roughly follow what you expect, as in they look roughly like the diagrams at the edge. Where, where you've added some tension is where you measure more tension. One thing I should say is, obviously these diagrams are when they're flat, is where the tension is stored. Of course, when you cut them out and let them go and let them relax, they bend because of this tension, which means they actually manage to relieve a lot of it. So if you actually try to create this diagram after the surface is bent, you find that a lot of the energy and, and essentially the forces have gone away. So, so the final state, because of the topological defect, these things are in a state of self-stress, right? They haven't released all of their energy. So if you cut them, they will react for example, but the forces actually, the tension held is really a lot smaller than it is at the beginning because it's been allowed to it's kind of like then dissipate. The, the second question is, re is regarding to one experiment. Uh -huh. is, uh, you, you mentioned about the change of thickness, but are they able also to change the lateral uh, size? And uh, yes. if they can, uh, uh, can, can you predict what would you expect in the um, in your model if they if you make a change on the thing in the lateral side? So, so in uh, currently in our model, we scale everything by the radius of the uh, of the disk, right? So essentially, that means that changing the thickness, you can think of it as changing the aspect ratio, right? And then changing the lateral size, we've scaled out, and this would come to. So, so really, the, the important thing is the ratio between the thickness and the radius, um, which is what we captured here. Changing the lateral size will obviously change other things that matter, such as the radius of curvature relative to the size of the sheet, that it, like the radius of curvature it wants to have relative to the size of the sheet, and the, uh, the young and small children, so stuff like this will become more important. But currently, we kind of scale them out, so I can't say for sure what would happen. Um, according to the theory. I know that Anne has, uh, has started doing some experiments like that, but I don't think we have any results yet. I mean, she's, yeah, not yet. Just for curiosity, what is the range of lateral sizes that they can achieve? In, um... in Anne's experiments? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that the aspect ratio goes from about, uh, I think it's from about 1 over 100 to about 1 over 10. Right, so it's in like the thickness is about 10% of the radius to the thickness about 1% of the radius. Okay. Um, but the actual size of these, I think they're quite large. I think they're like a couple of microns across, right? They're not, they're not really this small. A few hundred microns. A few hundred microns, kind of. Okay, that's it. Yep, I just had a question about so the, the shape is determined by the thickness, you said. Um, with the densities between the top of the, of the, uh, of the dome and the bottom <laughs> affect the given uh, shape it's going to want to take? So, yes, essentially. So, we've actually, we've actually in so Anne's experiment, we've actually done this, right? Because after it bends, you can look at the density across the plane. Of course, after it's bent, it's denser at the bottom because in order to bend, everything at the bottom had to get closer together. So, yes, is, is the broad answer. What the further ramifications are of this, obviously, this theory, it's what we call a linear theory. So, so we're saying, okay, as long as, as long as nothing goes crazy, this should happen. If, if some of these coefficients get really, really big, then we're going to have to expand the theory, include these higher order terms that Aurelia was talking about. Um, so, because it's a linear theory, we look at small changes, and we look at changes where essentially this. this the gel network that we're looking at, we're saying, okay, it doesn't change on this lane scale. Um, this, but this density could come into effect if you if you bend this gel first, right, and then somehow manage to re-solidify the network. So the network accommodates the current uh, configuration into a kind of strange for accommodation, and then the myosin uh, maybe you supply it with more ATP. The myosin rode ro ro up again. Right? And then you're essentially starting from a different starting configuration. Right? And then, obviously, you wouldn't follow this because these obviously all have to rely on that they start as a disk. So you would have to develop some kind of other. I mean, the, the theory, as I said, will work for any shape. So you can still simulate it. Whether this predictor of the Kaplan stuff is still true, I don't know. I mean, there is definitely 
a higher order equivalent of that nuclear bomb. Anything else? No? Well, sorry for being a bit of time. And uh, remember.